I think it's going live in a second. Okay, thank you. Just bear with me a second, it's just setting it up. Bear with me. A second. Okay. Okay, I think it should be live. Yes, go for it. Okay, great, thank you. Well, um, I'd just like to begin by welcoming both members and officers to this meeting of the Audit and Governance Committee. Um, I'd also like to start to mention that the local authorities and police and crime panels coronavirus flexibility of local authority and police and crime panel meetings, England and Wales regulations, that's a catchy piece of legislation, came into force on Saturday the 4th of April 2020 to enable councils to hold remote committee meetings during the COVID-19 pandemic period. This is to ensure that local authorities can conduct business during the current public health emergency. This meeting of the Audit and Governance Committee uh, is being held remotely under these regulations via the Zoom application and is being recorded and streamed on YouTube. Thank you. Okay, so onto the agenda. And uh, the first item is apologies for absence. I haven't received any chairman. Um, we don't seem to have Councillor Alder just yet, but maybe she'll join us shortly. Okay, thank you. She's not in any way a waiting room or anything waiting to be admitted or anything like that, is she? No? Peter's shaking his head there, so I assume not. Okay, fine. Smashing. Okay, thank you. The next item uh, on the agenda is the minutes of the last meeting of the committee, which was the 22nd of September, and they begin on page seven of the pack that we've had uh, in advance of the meeting. Um, any comments on the meetings? Are, we, are members happy that they, that they represent a correct record of that meeting? Are we, are we doing blue hands? I'm sorry, I should have mentioned that earlier, shouldn't I? We're going to do blue hands? You'll need a proposal. Yeah, sorry. if we just take a proposal in a second. Okay, okay. Uh, would anyone like to propose the minutes as a correct record? Uh, Councillor Wall Booth, proposing, and Councillor Fernando, seconding. Um, all those in favour of that? I think that's unanimous. I just had. Uh, this is not. Under, um, just a quick, quick question really, under the strategic risk register last time, which was uh, section 173 of the minutes, um, Councillor Stowe um, asked the question about um, sort of settled status for EU residents in the district. And I think, um, I think Graham, I think you said you'd uh, follow this up with the head of communication strategy and policy. I don't know whether anything's happened about that. Um, Tony, have you heard anything more about that at all? No, I haven't. I, 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 think, yeah, I think I think I um I forwarded this. There was Graham did get back to me, and I think I forwarded this on to to members following an email. Did a couple you? of follow-up okay. points. I think it was included in there. If not, I can I can forward that again. I don't remember it um, to be honest, but um I'll stand corrected because it is. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, perhaps if you could just make if you if you're happy, it's gone. Perhaps you could just let us know when you sent it if you didn't mind, or just ping it around if you haven't. Absolutely, I'll follow that up, Chairman. Great. Okay. So I think that, that was the only question I had on the minutes. So I think we were happy with the minutes then. So then we need to move on to the next item, which is uh, Chairman's announcements. I haven't got any. So that's, that was easy. So um, moving on to item four, declarations of interest. Any declarations of interest? Anything? Okay, if anything sort of pops into people's head during the course of the meeting, if they just let us know. But uh, at the present time, there aren't any. Okay. So item five is section 106. It's beginning on page 23 of the pack. Uh, Jackie, is that, are you, is that your, are you on? Yes, that's me. Oh, marvellous. So basically the report is a follow-up to a report that went to PAYGO last September, um, which PAYGO is, is now morphed into audit and governance, actually asked for a follow-up report and members asked for further information on policy and practice. So this report basically covers legislative changes to section 106 and also the requirements for East Hearts Council to publish an annual infrastructure funding statement, um, which is attached as an appendices to the report. This is the first one that the council's actually produced. Um, we could have done it last year, but we weren't in a position to do it. So the deadline for actually putting it onto the website is the 31st of December this year. The report, as you will see, is ready to go. It just needs to be um, checked by comms to make sure that it is 
accessible for all versions to be read as an online document so that as soon as you know it goes through this committee if there are any amendments that members would like to actually note or make um, I am aware of the spelling mistake in it um, it will then actually go and be published on a page on the East Arts Council website with an additional three CVS or Excel spreadsheets, which are part of the SIL requirement, the SIL legislation requirements that we have to have um, these Excel spreadsheets. They're not particularly user friendly. I haven't circulated them to members because they're just lists of numbers and planning application references. They don't actually mean a lot unless you actually know the planning application reference. So I'm not exactly sure what central government is going to do with the details apart from add the figures up, but the report itself is quite explanatory on the amount of funding that we have achieved. Um, well, basically since records began in 1996 for East Arts Council. So that's the annual infrastructure funding statement. In addition, um, the policy changes of which this came about under, there have been other changes to section 106 um, as part of the new SIL legislation, which basically means that we can now actually charge a monitoring fee, which is quite good because that offsets the cost of me, um, for, and going forward, all new section 106s will have a monitoring fee included within them. Each one will be bespoke to the actual um, section 106 agreement and the development because as previously explained each section 106 is an individual legal document mm. and although the headings of the contributions are the same quite often all of the intricacies of the wording is different so there isn't a set fee for monitoring it is actually negotiated on a, an agreement by agreement basis so that is part one part two is that we the requirement where you were not allowed previously to, there's no other way to say it, lump together five develop, more than five developments to actually fund one infrastructure project has been lifted. This is quite significant for East Arts Council because we have some major infrastructure projects going on, such as the Leisure Centre redevelopments and the Hartford Theatre developments. And it has meant that I've been able to write into new agreements and use historic funding from old agreements to go towards the budget costs of these major infrastructure projects. So that is very significant to note for East Arts Council. Going forward, the report also covers um, the use of Section 106 agreement funding. Um, I don't like to keep actually saying this out loud, but I'm going to say it again. Section 106 agreements are bespoke legal documents where the wording and the contributions are set in stone and you cannot use them for things that are actually not identified within the agreement. So they can't be seen as a sort of funding source for any projects that people have. There is a little bit of flexibility in some wording, as I've pointed out, you know, outdoor sports contributions in an area can go to any type of outdoor sports as long as it's in that area. So, you know, that is available then for both internal and external funding bids. So internally, the council can apply for funding itself for internal projects such as you know our own outdoor spaces and outdoor sports and so can local organizations and groups um, we have a set process of actually how we do this and it's explained in the actual report on that i have set up a web page where just to make sure that everybody in the council and in East Hearts knows of the availability of this funding, that they can actually fill out an expressions of interest form, which then comes directly to me that says who they are, where they are, what they want to do and roughly how much they're looking for. Then I can sort of use that to identify against historic contributions that we're gradually whittling down. And also, if I can't fund it at that particular time, I can add it to my list of potential projects where when planners come to me and say, We're, there's a new development in, in such and such an area, what projects have you got locally? I can say, oh yes, I know that the local bowls club 
needs something, therefore we can write it into the agreement. Mm. So that's been quite proactive. And again, I'll appeal to all members to make sure that all of your wards know about this. Mm. And please come to me if you have any potential projects or any ideas or things like that, because I'm always looking for new stuff. Jackie, so, I was just going to one question, if I may. Yeah, Does, of do, you think we're doing en- do you think we're doing enough to sort of make the, the public, if you like, aware of, of these pockets of funding? And, 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 and is there any more that you think we could do? May I, and, and that's, I guess, do, do members here think there's any more we could do, I guess? I, I'd say it's a, that's a difficult question because unfortunately we're a very large district and I do have areas that are crying out for funding but they've had no significant development in that locality. So I don't have actual any section 106 funding for them. Bennington is uh, a prime example that I know they want to actually look at their village hall, but I have no funding in that local area that could go towards it and potentially not much coming forward. So I don't want it out there so that it raises expectations and then we get a sort of backlash when everybody sort of sends me all the expressions of interest and I go back to them all saying I'm terribly sorry I can't fund that it is it that's where I need sort of members with their mm. local knowledge to actually come to me because you have an idea of what's being developed in your wards and an idea of you know what local need is so this is why I'm sort of asking for yeah. um, your information and your input Sure. Does anyone want to comment on that particular point while we're on it, or are we happy to just to move on? Tony Castlestowe. I had a situation, my two village rural ward of Aston and Datchworth. There's a big development coming up in Aston, east of Stevenage. And yet you, you contacted me about outside sports facilities, but in both my villages. Now, that, that got to Aston got to know about this and they got a bit of a hard time on parish council meeting wondering why Datch was, was being considered for 106 money on the job in their patch. Could you explain that for me? Um, I was given the information by the planning authority and I, I think, to be honest, it, it was potentially that uh, it was an outdoor sports contribution, um, which was a significant amount of money. And there is a very large sports centre in Datchworth that serves the whole community. And that was what was put forward as potentially a source of use of the contribution. I sort of came to you because I wanted to expand it to actually include Ashton. And I have been in contact with nearly, I think, every single sports community group in Ashton itself um, Mm. to actually make sure that they're not forgotten. But... It can be that, you know, when developers and planners get together, they don't have the local knowledge of the actual area. And they look at, you know, what is the biggest um, group or organisation in the area? And that gets put forward as a potential beginning of looking at the actual project. This is where I sort of come in and where, you know, the building of my lists of potentials works well so that we can actually, you know, all work together to make sure that the, the smaller groups don't get forgotten. So, thank you. Yeah. Okay. I don't. Oh, Councillor Huggins. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, just the way this is phrased um, about whether or not there's developments in the area um, raises questions on whether there are rules or guidelines about the uh, the distance from a development that would investment or is it ward specific uh, just some uh, feedback on that would be great now this is this is where I might have to actually ask James because there is the word in a lot of um, section 106 agreements is vicinity there isn't an actual legal definition of vicinity because I, I've tried to find it to see if it actually covered an area it does come down to sort of like individual um, guidance from sort of like planners and senior officers Um, you have to take it as a sort of guideline you know you can't if you um, if you have a development in a particularly rural area 
but it is in effect the next village along that has the infrastructure and the, the community hall or you know the play area where all the local kids go to but it is the next village and it is a drive away you know you have to take it on board that that is in the vicinity because it is where the actual uh, contribution will be most used by the residents and the people whose development it is so that that's my vague answer on that one it, it all comes down to individual agreements and individual locations we try to please all the people all the time but sometimes we can't and uh, that's sufficient for me thank you thank you chairman councillor ward booth i think has got a question um, yep. chairman yes sorry yes um, councillor alder has just joined and um, presume she can hear everyone can yes you're on mute angela now, my apologies for late arrival. I've had a job getting connected, so I may get disconnected any minute now. You never know. But oh, no sorry, problem. my apologies for being late. No problem. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Councillor Booth, you had a question? Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, I think it's paragraph 3.43 um, 3 in the report, which talks about the £900,000 odd of unallocated um, funding. Mm. Uh, you identify in that the just over £120,000 that's earmarked for outdoor sports in Buntingford. Mm -hmm. I just wondered if you could run, sort of briefly run through what the other, the remainder of that money is earmarked for. Um, yes, I could do. It's made up of quite a lot of individual contributions. I picked on the 122000 because that is one one contribution and it's a significant amount. I do have other ones going down to sort of like 2,000, 3,000. We, um, but let me just see. I, I do have a master spreadsheet on this. So, and, and I, I suppose the broader point is are, are those unallocated pots being, are you speaking to ward members to say, yes, I've got this unallocated pot which has to be used by X and it must be used for Y? Have you exactly. Got any Etc. Yeah. That's exactly what I've been doing over the last year. I've been going through the historic contributions that we've received to make sure that, you know, where they're coming to the end of their time period, that all they're all spent or allocated to the correct use within the time frame. Um, as I can say, I, I've got here. Let's have a look. Yes, I've got 2,879 towards the provision of community centres and village halls serving the development. But that is that has no named project, but it's in Hartford. So, oh, I just lost my screen. So basically, you know, I will be looking um, to potentially use that one at Hartford Theatre because that is, a, you know, a main source of community use in Hartford and it's a major infrastructure project for the council. So that's how it goes, basically. There's lots and lots of little individual ones. And that's where some of the wording is a little bit vaguer than actually a lot of the projects. There seems to have, I can only sort of like speak as I've actually come across the documents. It, it depends on who actually created this Section 106 agreement as to whether it's got very tight, specific wording. Um, for a named project and the immortal lines of and no other use or whether it's for towards the provision of within the vicinity of which makes it a little bit more flexible for me to actually find uses for it so there is quite a bit um i'm just having a look at my spreadsheet yes i've got forty-seven thousand pounds towards the provision of outdoor sport in the parish of standon so you can see that, you know, sometimes it's a little bit vaguer. In fact, most of this unallocated is towards the provision of outdoor sports, because that seems to, that is a, a contribution that gets a significant amount of funding because of the um, need for outdoor sport and recreation use within the whole of East Hearts. And again, I'm 
in constant touch with Sport England to make sure that you know we are allocating it according to actual need across the district. Okay, thank you. Councillor Bulbuth, did you have a sub? Is that okay? Yep, that's yeah. fine. Thank you. Brilliant. Councillor Huggins, I think you had your hand up. Uh, yes, well, uh, a supplementary building on that. Can we uh, say now confidently that ward members are aware or are not aware of what is unspent within their wards? I sincerely hope so. I have been, I've been working on the ones that need to be spent soonest, the ones that are nearing the end of their time mm. period on the historic ones that I've inherited to make sure that they're actually... Um, identified and we're looking for projects for those. We do have various new ones in the last year that have come in. And again, I do have a significant amount around Puckridge and Standon. So I am actually now beginning to look at that and to identify projects in that area with the actual ward members. Okay, well, speaking on behalf of myself, I'm aware of one section 106 that I've got coming forward, which is a fairly recent application. But other than that, I'm not aware of any um, unallocated funds for my ward. So I, I couldn't speak for other members, but um, it would be good to have confidence that where, it, there were, where there are funds, members are definitely aware. Okay, thank you. Um, Jackie, do you think, so you're, you're happy that you've done enough to make sure that members are Away. is it worth do you think is, is I don't it worth think doing? I've ever done enough until all of the, uh -huh. you know I don't think I'll actually be happy until I can actually say everything's allocated when it comes in it's allocated yeah. I do have some historic ones that are very difficult to find a project that legally I can spend the money on and that's where I'm going to have to be um, creative in, in finding something and working with other authorities such as the county council or sort of like the canals and rivers trust countryside management service to actually make sure that they are actually allocated for a sustainable use within the time frame. Um, Can, it, is, the it is a work in progress and if there are sort of if there is um, funding for certain wards that actually I haven't ident that I haven't contacted the ward members with as yet, it does tend to mean that the project is there for the village hall. It's for a named thing and it isn't reaching the trigger. We've only recently got it in. Okay. So it is a, a work in progress. Would, would outdoor sport, would that include things like cycle track, cycle, improving cycle facilities, do you think? Uh, it can do. It certainly can. I have been working with Councillor McAndrew on this because I he sort of is championing cycle routes yeah. across the district. Yeah. And I've also been working with my counterparts in highways at HCC because mm. they have all the sustainable transport um, and highways section 106 contributions. Mm. So I have quarterly meetings with them to actually make sure that any funding that I've got, if they have a project within the area where I have funding that we can actually join together yeah. and make sure that, you know, my funding is allocated to them to actually make their project bigger and better. I wonder if, if, you know, if you're having problems identifying areas of sort of outdoor sports sort of provision that needs improving. I wonder whether cycle way, well, yeah, improving cycling facilities might be a, a good way around that. I think, I think everyone would be pleased to see those improved, you know, across the district, I would think. Oh, yes, anyway, I agree. Anyway, yeah. OK. I don't think there are any more questions at the minute. I just, on paragraph 3.22, you talk about um, making sure that all the various contributions are collected from the developers. Yeah. I just sort of, I just wanted to get some sort of some comfort around the fact that we're on top of making sure that the developers are paying on time and we're not missing sort of payments. So they, 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 we end up sort of in a position where before your time, where we were sort of da flirting dangerously with maybe these things lapsing. Uh, yes, I've done an awful lot of work on yeah. chasing up outstanding contributions and you'll be very pleased to know that I do actually charge compound interest on late payment fees. Yeah, I, know, I think you, know, yeah. you mentioned that later in your report, yeah. don't you? About the yeah, so I, I've been basically, um, since I came into position, which is 18 months ago now, hmm. I've been reviewing all of the Section 106s just to make sure that they've all been paid and that they've all been, you know, if there's various ones where... 
um, how can one put it nicely, where certain developers think they've paid because they've paid the county council contributions and they casually forget that they've got to pay the district council contributions. Mm -hmm. So um, we've chased a lot of those up and um, working with James as head of legal and um, an insolvency practitioner, we've recently had a, a success on getting um, outstanding overdue contributions from a developer who um, one of his companies um, went into liquidation, but by doing some sort of some digging around and historic looking at all the land ownership and the original Section 106 agreements, managed to get the money out of the original company. So that was a, a major success, but it was a significant amount of work. And I don't know, I felt like a cross between Robin Hood and Miss Marple on that one. So we did get the money in. It paints an interesting picture. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Any other questions? I mean, because one of the things we need to look at is the uh, the statement, the uh, you know, that thing there. I found that fun cover. Yeah, yeah. that, that's one of the things we're asked to look at. And this is the thing that's going to go on the website, isn't it? I think, as yes, you mentioned. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I wonder if there are any questions on, on this in specific specifically. Um, can't see I, have, I have tried to make it as readable as possible. That's why there's quite a lot of words in it, to try and actually explain the tables within there because the legislative requirements were sort of quite straightforward about you must list this amount of money that you've got what you used and what you spent it on and I wanted to try and make it um, user friendly for people who don't um, deal with section 106 every day because I know when I first came to this section 106 can be a little bit confusing so if anyone has any questions I will try my best to answer them. On page 127 of the pack, which is, talks about new Section 106 agreements signed in 2019-20, in the yep. third paragraph, talk about um, affordable ho homes, and you've got 560 as a number there. Yep. Is that the total number of affordable homes that were built, or just those that were connected with Section 106? Uh, no, that is not the total amount built, because, to be honest, most of those haven't actually been built yet. These are the numbers listed within the agreements that are signed within the financial year 1920. So where you actually have um, Bishop's Bish 5, Land of Whittington Way, which I know is Bishop's Dortford South, they've literally just started building that, but there will be up to 229, oh sorry, 299 affordable homes on that development. But that's going to be over the next five years plus as they actually go forward and build it in phases okay. so and the legislation basically says that you have to list the amount of affordable housing proposed within the legal documents so which is what i've identified okay i think it is in the report somewhere but i just can't quite remember where on um, you mentioned um i think on the previous i'm not quite sure what page it is but you, you talk about there are certain circumstances where contributions are made in lieu of uh, affordable housing. Yes. And can you just give us a explain sort of how, how that works? So, what, for instance, I think on the table there, there's 122,000, 187,071 p allocated mm -hmm. in that regard. Um, what? How would that be? How would that be spent? And you know, what sort of? Right. Well, basically, this is this comes about where a development doesn't have. Um, provision or, or actual room to have affordable housing on site and the developer and the planners come to an agreement yeah. that uh, a financial contribution will be made in lieu of housing on site. This, money this is on is page 134 by the way I've just found it so it's, it's, it's in the table on page 134 of the pack and it's the very the very top of that table. Yeah it's all right I'm you're flapping around here. Yes, yeah, so forgive me, I didn't know the page number initially. Oh, that's fine. I've got it here. Yes. Yep. That was basically, um, yeah, as part of the legislation requirements for producing this report, you actually have to identify a total of what the actual funding is within the actual Section 106 agreements that are signed in that financial year. So I had to go through and work out how much had been added up for affordable housing. Um, once we actually get this money, it is then actually transferred into a capital budget and held 
where it will actually be going forward um, to be used for affordable housing across the district. This is where it actually is is good in a way to actually get the money in. Unfortunately, you know, it, um, the actual money coming in is probably not able to be spent within next to the development. So it, it actually comes in and it, it is down to other officers within the property section mm -hmm. and finance sections to actually allocate this funding onto their projects. Because I mean, because we, we're, not, we're not really in the business of building affordable houses. So do we, do we, do we, do we kind of, help housing associations build affordable housing for instance that sort of thing it would, that would happen i guess yes and it has gone towards some actual um other developments and, and purchases of housing unfortunately i, ca I can't answer that one because I, I don't actually get to spend the money in that section oh. i i just collect it in and actually put it into a budget code fair enough okay thank you we can we can find out if if people would actually like a breakdown of where the money is going well, I'd be quite interested in knowing that, if you wouldn't mind, actually. Mm -hmm. If you wouldn't Make mind. It that'd, that'd be quite interesting. Councillor Alder, I think you've got a question. You're on mute. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you, Pardon. Mr Chairman. I am now. Um, <laughs> well, the, the, um, the latest one in Bishop Stortford, uh, around Thorley. Now, Thorley Parish Council were very opposed to all that was going on on that site. Uh, but there will be substantial sums of money coming out of the development. Could Par um, Thorley Parish be bidding for some of that because they've got infrastructure within their vi within their village? Um, would they be uh, entitled to um, make a bid for some of the money, or would it just go all go to Bishop Stortford Town Council and they would, or Bishop Stortford? Are we, are we talking about the Bishop Stortford South development? Yes. Bish 5. Sorry, yes. yes. Yeah, the section 106 for that has recently been completed and signed. So that's why it's listed in the, the report. Um, unfortunately, I, I, I don't have that one to hand at, at the moment. It would take me a few moments to actually locate yeah. it to see. Perhaps we could do, do that get, one after. Perhaps we could do yeah, that one after. I, I can get back to you on that one, Angela, and, yeah. and let, let you know, Councillor Alder, let you know what was in that section 106 agreement. Um, I've got another question, a similar one to the one before on page 136. At the top of the table on page 136, it, it, it started as being a revenue contribution for open space and grounds maintenance. Yeah, that's basically where, um, where we have a section 106 agreement and we have money coming in as capital to fund something such as um, in effect, I'll, I'll explain. Um, we get money in to improve a play area. We also get a revenue amount um, to actually fund the ongoing maintenance of that. And this is where they're listed as revenue because they're, they're basically a revenue contribution for open space and grounds maintenance. And it's written into the planning obligations supplementary planning document, the SPD that whenever we actually get a capital contribution in for a specific project, we actually ask for a maintenance contribution for 10 years of funded maintenance so that it, it's not a burden on the council. So this is where I've listed them as revenue contributions so that you can actually see that, you know, they're there and the, you can actually see the total amount, the annual spend per year and then the actual balance Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I don't believe, well, Jackie, is there anything else you wanted to say? Um, it was, there was just one thing. Um, yeah, sure. When I, when I actually wrote the report, I didn't have access to the um, response to the consultation on the planning from central government. So I just listed it. Um, if members do want to actually see the official council response to the consultation that can be circulated because unfortunately I didn't have it in time to actually add it in as an appendices where I actually listed the the white paper I can actually circulate the official council responses to the white paper consultation so that members are aware of what was actually said 
Okay, that would be quite useful, I think. My would paragraph is just a very brief summary that covers the section 106 part okay. of that document. That would be quite useful if you wouldn't mind, if yeah, that could be circulated to members after the meeting, that would be very useful. Thank you. Okay, so then we've got, there are, if that, if we go back to page 23, we've got two recommendations. Mm -hmm. I think the first one is we're noting the potential changes to the um, section 106 as outlined in the future white paper, which we've, we've kind of discussed, haven't we? And we've looked at the update report on the collection allocation of of section 106, you know, the annual infrastructure funding statement report. And I think we've, I don't think we've got any comments on that, just, well, apart from the ones we've discussed, but nothing apart from sort of some, you know, minor typographicals. Mm -hmm. So members, those two recommendations, are we happy to, those two recommendations get passed? Do you think we need a proposer? Mm -hmm. Councillor Stone propose, seconder. Councillor Corp to second, all those in favour? That's brilliant, thank you. Thank you very much, Jackie. Thank you so much for your report. That's a, that's a really Thank impressive you. piece of work. Thank you. Yes, Thank it was you. quite You're enjoyable. You're very welcome to, to stay, or you can go if you if you need if you would like to. Thank you. I, I might stay for a while because it's, it'd be quite interesting to see what's coming up in the budgets. But if I disappear suddenly, you'll 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 understand. I hope. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You're on mute there, Chairman, sorry. Next item on the agenda is strategic risk monitoring, uh, page 141. Right. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Eve Neal. As you'll be aware, leadership team is asked to review the descriptions, scores and update controls that they have introduced or they have planned in the reporting period, which is quarter to um, July to September. As requested at September's meeting, a track change version of the register has been submitted as well as the as well as a clean version. So I hope um, you're pleased with that. Although there was talk of having a um, sort of an advancement on that document, but um, get your thoughts in a short while. I have received minimal changes to descriptions. You'll see an item two that in response to the question raised in the minutes, the date that the EU settled um, status data was compiled at is listed. I think that's June 2019 from memory. Um, I can recirculate sort of through Will the, the, the response that um, Ben Wood kindly provided after the last meeting. Um, all scores remain unchanged with the exception of item three, the performance and resilience and security of IT systems where the likelihood mm -hmm. and the impact have reduced, both reduced from a three to a two. Um, in the table, if you do need to see a summary of the scoring, is it at the foot of the register? Sorry. Um, item four, the HR risk reflects the current status of the jobs market during the pandemic, as pointed out during the last meeting. So I, I hope you're um, pleased with the changes made there. And item eight covers some more detail on um, COVID response in the high streets, which I think was expected at the last meeting. So I don't um, have any more um, amendments really to draw to your attention. So are there any questions on the content of the register? I've got a... Question. I don't know if anyone else has. I'm sorry, me. I can't see your blue hands over there. But I mentioned it to to, he to Helen before the meeting that I, I think it's mentioned in the pa in the papers and on page one four seven of the pack. The 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 scores for uh, with, with respect to performance resilience and security of IT systems have been downgraded slightly. And I understand that the reason for that is because you know I think we're in a better place maybe than we have been in terms of. Our, our ability to defend ourselves against th these sorts of attacks. And, and, I, and I just happened to mention it, and I don't know about what anyone else thinks, you know, this is the only organisation I think I've been associated with where the scores are going down with regard to cyber. Everywhere else I've, I've been, you know, people are just keeping the scores higher, even increasing them. But I, 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 do, but I do understand why that, why that maybe the likelihood has gone down, but certainly I just need to understand why the impact has come down. Is it? Would it be because 
we think that the likelihood is less and so the impact is less. Because if, if such a thing happened, then the impact would be quite serious, wouldn't it? And I, I, I'd just be interested just to know the rationale behind that. And I, I don't know if anyone else would, but I certainly would be. Thank you, Councillor. I mean, certainly, as you will see from the chart, we have been aiming to take both the, uh, the likelihood and the impact down to two, um, the risk on both of those items. So I think certain, my rationale behind this was from a year ago, we are in a completely different place to where we were. We have replaced our network. We have got cutting edge um, technology protecting us. We have got, we're in a better position to recover as well, which is why the impact is not so great. So if we had had a, an attack last year, we would have been in quite a poor place as far as both managing that security breach as well as then recovering from the incident. We now have got a significant change to what we're doing. We've got a much better way to recover. We are tracking our devices to enable, to ensure that devices aren't attached to the network when they shouldn't be. So we have reduced the risk considerably. Um, and I really wanted just to reflect that we are making excellent progress, if not already there, to the mitigation position um, of two and two. Okay, Another point you. I could add to that, the, the council, we're, we're tendering insurance contracts at the moment or commencing a tender. And we're looking, we can look to arrange cyber cover. Um, which will put us in a stronger position and those products are far more widely available now. Um, some of those products will include testing of our systems and, and ongoing monitoring. So there are some, some insurance related solutions that we can look to put in place as well and we'll be reviewing those as part of the insurance tender imminently. Okay and will those be reflected in this schedule going forward maybe it's subject to whatever happens from those they will yes obviously i'll speak to helen um and to stephen and, and and colleagues as we go forward we're just launching the um the, the tender process at the moment fine i mean I, 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 it's a very it's a really comprehensive explanation i, I just i'm having a real job kind of reconciling the, the scores going down but anyway, I, I, I hear what you're saying and, and you, you can clearly know better than me, but are there any other questions from anybody on the, this section of the agenda? Forgive me, I can't, I've managed to lose all the blue hands. Uh, Councillor Corp has his hand. Councillor Corp, you have a question. Thank you very much, Chairman. So my question was on, on item seven. Um, so uh, this, uh, I suppose it's the, the risk of using third party systems for virtual meetings during the pandemic. So obviously the, the register has been amended because we're kind of back in, back in the lockdown situation as, as, um, uh, as we were hoping to perhaps be kind of starting to make physical meetings again. But I'm, I'm wondering if you could maybe tell me a little bit more about what the perce perceived risk is about using these third party systems. Because we've been doing this now for kind of nine months and my impression is that all things being told, this is actually in the end a fairly secure way of, of doing meetings. And in, in perhaps in some ways, um, due to the you know the fact that some of these services are encrypted, perhaps it's actually safer than you know <laughs> doing them uh, in a physical building where perhaps someone could sneak in or something. So I'm, I'm just curious to understand uh, what the the risks are as you see them uh, to using basically video conferencing services for meetings. Do you want me to tell that, Graham? Yeah, it'd be great. Thank you. Uh, so certainly, I think when we when we first all dived into Zoom in March, uh, there were some security issues around it. Uh, we were assured that things would be brought in quite quickly to stop that. And you, you I'm sure, may have been present to Zoom bombing um, right in the early days, as, as indeed we were. Um, but quite quickly, Zoom brought in some quite stringent security arrangements. And now there are a variety of things in place, which mean that you don't get people bombing in unless you aren't actually doing the security yourself. So I don't know if you're aware, but very recently um, you used to be able to hold a Zoom meeting and have no password. Well, you can still do that, but you have to now admit each person singly. You aren't able to um, sort of get over that. So either you have to set a, a Zoom password or you have to admit people coming in. So that is a really good step. That means that other people can't come into your meeting, they can't hear your meetings. Um, and we have 
on occasions we we had a quite a funny um executive meeting several months ago when somebody for a joke changed their name uh, and because they changed their name we actually barred them from the meeting and they couldn't get back in um so that was uh, a quite a funny moment but it, it is much much better now than it used to be i'm sure you're aware that uh next year we will be rolling out uh microsoft 365 we will then have a full version of teams we have got a cut down version at the moment so you can do uh quite a lot with the cut down version that we've got the, the main thing you can't do is you can't schedule a meeting in the future through actually microsoft teams so you can book a meeting um, with colleagues, but then you have to invite them actually at the time and day that you want the meeting. That will be resolved when we get the full version. And it's likely that we will move much more towards teams um, on an on a individual basis and for smaller meetings because it's all included in the costs that we're already paying for our 365 license. Uh, we are, at the, if we are still in this position, um, by the time Microsoft Teams rolls out, we're likely to keep a couple of Zoom licenses because certainly the bigger meetings like this, when you've got a dozen or more people um, dialing in, then it's a much better experience than on Zoom when you just end up in a box at the bottom. You know, we like to be able to see our members when we're, we're talking to them and meeting with them. And, and I've got mindset that I can get 49 people on one screen. So that pretty much covers uh, most meetings that I go to. So in answer to your question, Councillor Corp, yes, we're pretty confident that it's secure as it can be. Thank you very much. And if I may ask a, a follow-up, um, the with your permission, Chairman, um, the so I guess my point is that I saw later in the agenda that can, it seems like there might be in future a renewed um, emphasis on, I guess, working from home, uh, even in the in longer term uh, for council employees. Uh, due to kind of maybe finding alternative ways of delivering the services we provide and more efficiently. Um, so, I mean, basically, I mean, obviously I'm very reassured by what you say and, and that's fine, but I guess the gist of what I'm saying is, um, is, is this still, you know, if this is less of a risk, then maybe we don't need to, to be, well, I mean, it's good that we include it here, but maybe we can think uh, long-term that this is maybe not as much as a risk as it perhaps was originally when we started including it in the risk register. And, and certainly uh, that's very timely comment from you. So Ben Wood, who is also on the call today, and myself, we are working up a uh, paper to actually look at how the, the new future is going to look. Some of that will include a hybrid of, of how we are working now and how we worked before, um, because we, we are looking for efficiencies. You know, you're going to come onto the budget in a minute and, and Stephen Linnett is going to talk to you through some of the challenges that we're facing. So we're very much aware that we need to continue providing the essential and non-essential services to our residents. Um, but to do it in a really cost effective way. So I'm sure there will be a hybrid version that will we'll no doubt come to um, executive uh, and discuss with other members before we, we take those steps. But I think we've already seen the massive channel shift effect that COVID has had. And it's taken years off some of the things that we were trying to do with our residents in the matter of a few weeks because of necessity. So uh, although we, we did open up our council offices uh, back to the members of the public for um, appointment based um, visits in between the, the two uh, before we went back into lockdown too, I think Ben will confirm, I think we had one person in Hartford who uh, booked on the system to come in. What we have introduced is, is a telephone call booking system, which is very, very popular with our residents. So people can uh, call in um, and they can book an appointment where one of our staff from whatever team uh, they need to speak to will ring them back within an agreed time frame. And that is proving really, really popular right across the council. So all sorts of areas are using that. It's a really good use of staff time and resource, as well as it enables people to know within quite a short time frame that they're going to get a call back. As long as that callback happens, pretty much people are, are pretty happy with the service that they're getting and they don't want to revert back to how it was before. Thank you very much. Um, Chairman. Councillor Stowe, you had a That's question. Right. Sorry, Peter. Yeah. yeah. Angela, can I just, Councillor Alder, can, I just, can you hear us okay? Yeah, great, thanks. Okay, Councillor Stowe, sorry. Sorry, right. just going on from Just the... to say, Chairman, because I haven't got the um, agenda 
Uh, but I have to look at my, I'm looking at the agenda on my phone. That's why I've got my head down. But I'm <laughs> up here with what you're saying. <laughs> Thank you. We didn't think you were asleep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I bet Tony did. No, no, no. Now, all it was going on what we were talking about with the <laughs> use in these, you know, virtual meetings. I, I have a concern for our officers and members that some people are struggling still with this, um, you know, not seeing people face to face, not having that interaction with people. And often in the workplace, particularly with officers, it is very important that they have the opportunity to be with people sometimes rather than sitting at home in the bedroom or wherever it is they do their Zooming from. And I just want to make sure that we are thinking about that as well as the council. Thank you. Yes, we absolutely are. So you, you I think as members, you recently have been uh, invited to take part in a wellbeing survey uh, of all members. So that was done with staff um, a couple of months ago. So we have been paying particular attention to people who may have been struggling as you're describing. So we, well, before we were back into the second lockdown, we had a number of staff that were going into the office uh, on a regular basis that was agreed um, to enable them to, it, it's not some necessary people's mental health, sometimes their work set up uh, is not good at home, you know, they may have young children or, or they may be at home with their parents and they haven't got that space. So we, we did make allowances for people enabling them to go back into the office. Um, and we can actually, I think it's 125 people we can have safely back into the office um, and maintain COVID um, security within that. So, you know, people are doing lots and lots of, of different things. People are staying in touch. Uh, I was in the office three days last week because we had the little Haddam inquiry um, and I was, I was there with a number of other people. So, you know, we are, we're making a hybrid of that. So as much as we can, we're ensuring that, that people are, um, you know, they are being able to, to manage uh, either remotely or coming into the office. Um, so I think, and again, as you know, I said, Ben and I are looking at that and it, it will be a hybrid version in the end, I think, because there are some real advantages from working at home. Um, you know, things like tonight, for example, I've actually been able to eat before I come to the meeting, whereas, you know, when we were in the offices, you, you, you don't bother stopping, you just carry on through till seven o'clock and then go to the meeting. And, you know, some of us have been in those meetings till 10 o'clock, not too often, I hasten to add. Not, not this committee, I don't think, I think you're fine. <laughs> yeah, so you know, it's, it, it just makes my life easier, to be honest, you know, if I can actually, you know, rustle something up to eat and eat and then come into the meeting, then, you know, I'm happy. So I'm quite happy to carry on like this. And, and we've, I've, and Ben's highlighted before in, in other reports that I think uh, you may have been privy to, we have had a, an incredible, not, I'm not talking hundreds of people, we've had an incredible increase in the number of people that are actually watching the sessions on YouTube versus who used to watch the live webcast. So, you know, it, in one case, it might have been three people watching council is now 36 people. So I'm saying it's not hundreds of people, but the percentage is, that's going up is, is really high. So we're reaching a lot more people as well, which is, is great. Thank you. Is it something that ANG should be talking about? I guess, I guess it probably is. Just we need to be. Well, sort of, I suppose. But well, I'm just we thinking need to about, keep... the, about the, um, the benefits of working from home is, of course, look at the conditions of the road, the environment. I mean, it's, it's, it's wonderful. Chairman? Councillor Alder has a question. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, Councillor Alder. Thanks, Councillor Stoke. Councillor Alder? Uh, yes, well, I would support what um, Councillor Stowe has just said, um, because I'm also thinking about people uh, who are not internet connected, um, and they do value very much the human contact. It's the, the eyeball to eyeball sort of thing that you need to uh, be able to, to make that particular contact. But also there's the problem of... Con in um, the system's breaking down as I couldn't get into the meeting this evening. And um, a couple of the meetings I've had where, you, where you've been frozen. Um, and it's really very unsatisfactory, at least when you're in the same room, you don't get frozen. You might get frozen out because people don't want to talk to you. But mm -hmm. generally speaking, you can make human contact. So, uh, you know, I think we shouldn't be absolutely getting besotted with Zooming. 
Um, we need to keep our feet on the ground. Remember that we're all human beings and human beings need human contact. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if there are any other questions. I had a question on page 153 of the pack. And it, I, think it, I think the risk is poor performance or, or failure of a key pawn or contractor. And the kind of the mitigation is that regular discussions are continuing with contractors and third party providers to ensure no failures in delivery. And then, you, then, then it goes on the, on the mitigation column about credit risk scores are obtained. I'd be interested to know a little bit more about how those, how those are going and do we have any concerns about contractors? Into all that, or did our providers to make, or you know, that may cause us a, a problem, perhaps? Um, um, I'm not sure how. Sorry, Stephen. I was, I was, going, to, I was, going, to, I was going to answer it. Um, um, yeah, we get this great credit scores from um, reputable um, credit agencies, so we can see over time um, how companies are going along. We also pay particular attention to the trade press as well, because you can obviously, obviously sometimes get rumours in the wind about um, companies under pressure, and et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's, it's just continuous intelligence gathering and um, checking on their accounts when they lodge them with companies' house, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's just that it's just that trying to trying to spot early the sort of, um, you, you know, for example, Kia was almost going under at one point, several other people have gone under. It's, it's watching the trade press and, and watching their credit scores to see if you can get an early heads up about where that's going. Is this, this, it looks like it has a low light, well, low-ish likelihood. At present, uh, yes. Two. So, which is fine, but which I guess means you're on top of it, which is fine. Uh, at present, yes. Good. And then going down the mitigation column, the next bit um, relates to waste-related business. And I, I noticed, I think later on, in, when we talk about the budget, I think we're we're finding that the, 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 the sort of the price for recycled goods is is not particularly high at the moment generally. And I just wondered how serious you think that is for the council, and and, and how much of a hole this could create in our budget. Well, the recycling the recycling is virtually worthless now. Um, is is the sad fact of the matter is because since China closes borders to the recyclers, to recyclers. Um, it's, it's finding somebody who will take it. And while something might have a value one week, it doesn't have it the next week because the, the, the recycling facilities are full. Um, in terms of where we are on recyclers, uh, I think that's discussed in the budget report later yeah. on. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Uh, but but the, main, the, main, the main pressure this year on waste has been the, um, the loss of the, um, the, what's called the alternative finance model, which is an agreement that is a historic agreement that's been had with the county council and the 10 districts and boroughs in Hertfordshire, which is um, depending on um, the how the recycling is going against the residual waste, when the recycling increases, there's a share of recycling credit that comes back to the district councils. Since lockdown, we've seen a 12 to 13% increase in residual waste. Those increased disposal costs have wiped out any uh, recycling credit that was due to come back to the council. So there's a major financial hit there. And next year, the county's due to re review that uh, arrangement. I would probably be pretty safe betting that the county will not be carrying on with that arrangement. It is, after all, their responsibility as a disposal authority. They don't have to share those recycling credits with us. So it's just yet another budget pressure to manage within the overall budget pressures. So are you sort of having discussions with other authorities just to see, to see what they're doing and sort of see if you can band uh, together well, to do things, I guess? As, as districts and boroughs, um, at the moment, we, we take our recycling away to the processes that we, we've, we've chosen because they had a value to them. Because they don't have a value anymore, we're just paying, basically paying haulage. The disposal authority, the county, we can just present the recycler to the county and it becomes the county's issue to deal with it. But rather than play games, which is to no advantage of the taxpayer at all, we're trying to come to a mature, we're having mature discussions with the county about what is the best thing to do and what will not disadvantage the taxpayer overall. But they're, they're just ongoing discussions at the moment about what's best and where to take, where to take things. So is, is the, lower, the lower, I guess the lower prices we're getting for recycled goods, that's reflected in the budget proposals that we'll see later in this, this pack, we'll be, I guess. We'll be working through the, when the figures come through at a later meeting, um, yes, certainly that you will see lower figures for the recycling. Sure. going through and, and as i say we do have the if we're not getting any value for us at all we do have the option to present it to the county because the county are obliged to take it as a disposal authority yeah. okay i guess that's something that the you know the, the public need to be aware of i guess not be aware of but it's something because you know it's really affecting our ability to to recycle isn't it i guess 
just in this section, in this, in this section that we talked about, which is which is section five, the very last little bit. So it, it, we talk, we're talking about waste recycle business. And then we talk. Then we go on to say, talks are ongoing with other hardware authorities to determine alternative business continuity planning options. Is that with regard to recycling? That, that is in regard to recycling because there's a particular oper operator in um, St. In St Albans, I think that people were considered to be concerned about, but that concern has started to drop away now. So it was just what we were going to do if that particular operator suddenly closed and we were suddenly we were suddenly starting to build up large amounts of recycling that we couldn't take anywhere. Okay, and again, that would be a, a discussion to be had with the county about um, contingency arrangements should that happen. But the, the, the concern over that particular operator has started to drop away, as I say. OK, thank you. OK, I don't believe there are any other questions. So the recommendation on this item is on page 141. Yeah, I don't think we need a We don't need a vote necessarily on this chair. It's just uh, sort of noting. OK, in which case, if we're happy to note that then, then we can move on to item seven, which is the quarterly corporate budget monitor, which begins on page 175. Chairman, um, this is a bit of a historical document now since we've um, moved into the second lockdown. Um, but as at the end of quarter two, the um, revenue, uh, projected revenue overspend was only £168,000. Um, you will see in the, um, the main uh, cause of variance um, in service area budgets is the loss of value in recyclers and the alternative financial modelling, uh, which is contained within the report, which has a significant impact and likely to have impact going forward. Uh, in terms of the capital program, you'll see the revised budget is now 70.499 million with a 30.898 million carry forward into future years. I have to say, Chairman, that this is a historic way, this is the historic East Hearts way of um, um, budgeting for capital to put all of the all of the capital program amount, even though it will spread over many years into one year and approving it. And as, as part of this budget, we'll be seeking to make sure that the capital program actually reflects which year the expenditure is going to take part in. It take place in and then you will be able to then see a, a, a direct correlation between the capital program and the rec capital financing in the revenue account so we'll be changing that going forward to make it more meaningful and and to make sure that it, that we don't have these rather large carry forwards between years which can make budgeting and, and monitoring indeed for members very difficult thank you thank you okay we've got the report ladies and gents any questions so, so the, you, we know we're well, obviously we're noting that the overspend is 168k, which is 68,000 more than last time. I think I think when we did when we looked at this in September, it was about 100. I think so, which is which I think, and we've got the reasons for this. Uh, we're looking at sort of powers. Well, 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 we start off in the report, I guess. In paragraph 2.10. Um, we talk about some there's some reduced rental income from Charrington's house, and I think the the the, the I guess the subsidy I guess we, we're calling it I think is that going to be offset against sort of relocation costs? For that, um, for that, for we that have tenant. had we have had at least two tenants now ask for a rent review, which we have granted because we've taken the advantage to put break clauses in their leases so that we weren't paying substantial. So it's it's basically reduced the the compensation that we would have to pay to. Yeah. To, to get them out of the building in order to hand it over for redevelopment. So in, in return for the, that um, lower rental, and I did go through their accounts to make sure that they weren't just, you know, trying it on. There was a legitimate reason that they were asking for that rent rent reduction. So we've taken advantage of, of that rent reduction. We've also been charging for car parking spaces where they've had them free in the past. Mm -hmm. And um, it also taking the opportunity to insert the break clauses, which gives us greater flexibility and reduces the um, compensation payments going forward. Oh, that's a very good idea. Councillor Walbu, I think you had a question. Thank you, Chairman. Um, very quick question about paragraph 2.11 of the report on the democratic and legal services overspend. Um, just querying really what the agency worker support referred to was. Uh, hi, Councillor Ward Booth. Um, yes, the legal department in particular, the, um, is down on solicitors at the moment. Therefore, for a, a considerable amount of time, we've been having to 
uh, pay for agency workers to cover those posts. Um, in total, the, the legal team have a force list of posts which need to be filled. Um, we've very recently in, um, gone to advert for those. We'll be shortlisting and interviewing for them soon. Uh, the hope being that we'll be able to have an in-house team, uh, with, meaning that we don't need to have agency work anymore, which will uh, result in a saving for the council. But that's what's caused that overspend. Thank you. A quick supplementary on that. How much of the, because obviously a significant amounts of um, uh, particularly planning and building control uh, overspend is due to legal appeals and, and costs associated with that. How much legal work, are you, are you recruiting people who will be able to do some, I appreciate they won't be counsel, um, but would these posts once filled be able to handle more of the work in-house to alleviate that sort of pressure? Certainly that is the hope. Um, we've advertised them in such a way that they are open to council if they want to uh, apply as well. Um, what we've done uh, with regards to the job descriptions and person specs and that kind of thing is pitch them at the level that we want to be able to sell to as you say, Councillor Ward Booth, be self-sufficient in what we uh, are doing We're, uh, and being able to cut out the need to get specialist advice in. We won't be able to cut that completely. Um, there will be instances when we do need to get that high level of uh, counsel, uh, counsel to help us. Um, however, the, the aspiration is that we're able to cut the majority of it um, so that the people that we gain are able to do the, the vast amount of the work and therefore the money that we are spending on uh, getting that into that external help uh, is greatly reduced going forward. Thank you. Thank you. That's all good. Is that okay? You're happy with that? Yes. Thank you. Right. Councillor Corp, I think you had a question. Um, we've got a handout from Angela Alder as well. Sorry. As okay. Well. Uh, Councillor Alder next after Councillor Corp. Thank you very much. I was actually going to ask a very similar question to Councillor Walker. Thank you. Thank I had, you. Um, um, it's, uh, on, um, Hang on, Councillor Alder. A. Councillor Alder, sorry, I think Councillor Court was first. Oh, beg your pardon. It's all right, no, don't worry. Sorry about that. Uh, so my, my the other question I had was uh, regarding this uh, item 2.10, in particular the underachievement uh, from Millstream. So, uh, so the explanation that's given here is that, that Millstream wasn't able to buy properties in line with the business plan. And I remember last time we discussed the, the budget that Millstream was supposed to be um, you know, one of the stepping stones to kind of closing the budget gap that we discussed, um, I suppose, nearly a year ago now. So I suppose it's um, a bit disappointing that it wasn't able to, to kind of meet those targets, but of course the pandemic got in the way. But I would, I would like to ask, because there were no restrictions on, on the trade of properties during either lockdown. And in, I mean, yeah, th there was, if anything, uh, you know, people being incentivized to, uh, to sell with this uh, stamp duty holiday. So I'm just a bit curious what the actual issue was with being able to pursue that business plan, even during the pandemic. As I recall, you couldn't, estate agents were closed during the initial lockdown period, I think, possibly. And then there was the risk of, of people um, visiting houses, etc. I, I do know that Millstream, have, I think they bought six properties in the last two months, actually. So are heading back towards getting on track with the business plan. Um, now, this is obviously the position is at the end of September. So, I mean, and then I think it's at least six properties I've seen going through um, in the last two months or so. So... But there is a, first of all, you've got to have people who are wanting to sell and, and people moving from different parts of the country, et cetera, et cetera. I think initially during lockdown, there was a, a sort of, there was a sort of dead hand moment when everything stopped completely. And then it started to move very slowly. And then obviously with the announcement of the um, stamp duty window, it's, um, it's heated up almost exponentially. And um, in, indeed there's almost um, like pit bulling now to, to solicit a time to um, complete conveyancing, et cetera, to, to be in, in time to meet the stamp duty window. So, I think the company's recovered some of its position on this, um, but you'd, ha you'd have to address the question of, of why they didn't particularly go out there and do the stuff they were doing to the, to the company rather than to me, because uh, I think I've had one meeting with the company so far, so I can take that back and ask them to get back to you. Um, I, well, I think it might be something that was sort of, of general interest, I suppose. Um, but yeah, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not uh, necessarily expecting you to have all the answers on this. I was just uh, curious if we, if we had a bit more understanding, but... 
yes, it's good to hear that this is maybe uh, back on back on track uh, now with uh, the restrictions kind of somewhat less stringent this time around. Thank you. Councillor Alder, I think you had a question. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's on Appendix A, um, and it's the LED lighting. Uh, I, I, you probably can't give me an answer this evening, but I'd be interested to know what the anticipated savings are as a result of uh, these upgrades to LED. And are all the light, I can't remember what the lighting is in Wolf, in uh, Woolfields, but um, I'd be interested to know what the savings, what savings have been anticipated by this upgrade. Thank you. I think these are LED lights both inside and outside, so on the lamp columns as well. So you want to know the anticipated saving from the from the LED from all the LEDs installed? Yes, yes please. Right. Thank you. Just going back to paragraph 2.10, the, the last bullet, the 200,000 underachievement of the financial sustainability saving target, is that millstream related as well or is that something different? I think that's related to the fact that um, we are struggling with um, finding a suitable commercial investment at the moment in the property market that isn't something that is like a leisure centre, et cetera, which, or, a, um, or a retail business, which um, obviously has declined in value somewhat and are not those are not that attractive as investments as they were. So I think I think in terms of finding something with a decent rent covenant and a tenant that you know is going to stay is proving um, difficult for us. Um, those sort of uh, those sort of properties with those sort of covenants are being sl slapped. I mean, are being um, hoovered up by the um, the blue chip um, property companies. Indeed, the, the two uh, property funds that we ha are invested in are the sorts of people who are moving in on those and take and, and hoovering them up. Whereas, I mean, you, we have seen some of the large um, shopping, out-of-town shopping centre um, companies going out of business um, as a result of the pandemic. So I can, we can buy retail coming out of our ears, but you wouldn't want to be buying retail right now. Yes, OK, thank you. Uh, Councillor Warburg, have you got a question? Well, I, I, as I sit on the Financial Sustainability Committee, I was only going to add to that that um, Stephen's correct there is a, a shortage of um, opportunities that meet the criteria that the committee have set for investment um, I think quite rightly as, as Stephen says we're, we're taking quite a sort of sensible approach we're, we're not doing what some district councils have done and going mad and buying shopping centres and things so I think the the difficulty there is just a, a lack of suitable investment opportunities I can't see another hands up. Oh, yes, Councillor Huggins' hands up. Councillor Huggins, yes, sorry. Yeah, again, on that committee, I just add the importance of that financial sustainability uh, committee and the work and actually getting that budget spent. The, the pandemic first lesson is, of course, the need for reserves because of the cover yeah. it gives us. But the second should be that we need a diverse portfolio of income coming in. And of course, if we had um, started or increased the financial sustainability project earlier, um, perhaps we would have been in an even better position than we are now. Uh, so it is important that we do continue to look for the projects and get that budget spent every year. On the, on the bottom of page 182, it, it talks about... Um, sort of funds being used, funds coming from reserves and, and it mentions a few things like funding items at the net cost of services such as the Gilston Garden Town projects and expenditure on the IT shared service and the smoothing of the leisure contract costs. Could you just give us a bit of colour about what, what that entails and what, on what reserve that would come from? I can't give you the exact reserve, but um, what's happening is, is as the leisure centre, parts of the leisure centres are closing and as we're redeveloping parts of them whilst the existing leisure centre stays in operation, the leisure centre operator is, um, is, is incurring additional costs for um, 
obviously clearing up the dust, et cetera, but also uh, the, the way that we configure things on a temporary basis and then change them. So there's some additional costs there for the contract, which we're smoothing from reserves, but, but because at the end, the contract has agreed in the con as part of the contract that, that when those work, when the uh, investment in the leisure centers has been completed, the contractor will start to pay us for operating the leisure centers rather than us paying them to operate the leisure centers. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then the, I guess the last point, I guess, on this, or the only one I've got, is in relation, in relation to debtors, which is on page 184, uh, para six, and that little section. Um, I, I note that um, we've, we've recently received some, some, some invoices have been paid, but um, the amount of sort of aged debtors is quite a high number. And I guess we just need to, sort of flag that with you that, that you know how much of a concern is it for you should we be worried or are, are we on top of it i know covid's not helping but it's still quite a big number isn't it well my my attitude and, and having inherited a debt portfolio very similar which was full of full of chaff that was uncollectible the most important thing is to get it written out because if you can't collect it it's just distracting you you can't see the wood for the trees yeah and um you know the it, it, there is a provision for bad, for bad and doubtful debt, which is in the accounts. And if it's not collectible, I don't see that we should be wasting our time trying to collect it. I also um, have put in some um, behavioral economics stuff in the past, which is um, how you word your reminders and stuff like that. So that it actually prompts responses from debtors. And I'm also a great one for the nine o'clock on a Saturday morning, ringing them up because they don't expect credit control from the council at nine o'clock on a Saturday morning, <laughs> nor do they expect it at 7.30 at night. So um, I am prepared to... Um, I say to my, my team, um, I will give you some overtime if you work at these particular times and chase these debts. And, but it is, it is a constant, it is a constant thing that you have to keep doing and it is a, and it's a game. And um, the most effective way of getting debt is to contact them and telephone numbers and getting them on the phone and getting them at a time when they're not, when they can't say it one, they're just going out to work. So it, it, it but there will be a, a whole chunk of this which I suspect is uncollectible and we shouldn't waste our time trying to collect what's not uncollect what's uncollectible. Okay. <coughs> I suppose you weren't expecting it, this section 151 officer to say I'm just going to write some stuff off. <laughs> well, well no I mean I guess will that will that decision to come to this committee? Um, it, it will be within the well it'll be reported certainly I, I, I can't exactly recall off the top of my head the delegations on 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 debt write-off but I suspect, I suspect that you will find there's a lot in here that hasn't been touched in, in six years or so and probably couldn't prove the debt anyway. And there's no solicitors to take anything to court anyway at the moment, really. So. Right. OK. Well, OK, fine. Well, well I guess we'll have to think. Councillor Huggins, did you want to say something? Uh, just that the obvious question coming from those remarks is, will members uh, of this committee or all members be getting a, an indication of the proportion of that debt that is going to be uncollectible. Well, I can't say now because every every single debt will have to be gone through and decide whether it's collectible or not. So that's going to be an exercise. It's going to take at least six months, but it has to be done because, in my in my, in my opinion, if, if we're trying to collect trade waste from two or three years ago, um, especially from um, businesses in the current economic climate, that will require sensitive handling and things like that. So it's it's. It's, it's not an instant job, this. And um, there also seems to be a, a, a philosophical disagreement about whose job it is to chase debts as well in the council, which um, I think I'll have to res reconcile and resolve as well. So I will keep members uh, posted. But I think, you know, if it's not collectible, there really is no point in keeping it on the books because then you, you're just getting credit controllers to go over it time and time again. They can't do anything with it. And it just it just builds up and builds up. And it's. It, the best thing to do with debt that's built up and is not collectible is to get it out of the books. That does not mean that if the debtor reappears again and we can identify them and track them down, we will not write it back on and chase them again because we most certainly will. Yeah. But if we can't get collect it now and they've absconded, they're not in the district or stuff like that, and we can't be traced, then we should be writing it off. Uh, so it's interesting because, you know, uh, the, the subject of debtors has been discussed quite virtually every meeting i think members will recall and this, this is really the first time that this is the, the sort of the, the dreaded words right off have been used i think if, as far as i recall anyway anyway we'll um, just braver than other people well quite well you're, you're i guess you, 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 you yeah well anyway more real more realistic maybe 
Okay, well, look, I guess that's all we can. We just need to keep an eye on it. But clearly, you know, as you as you say, if it's not collectible, then it's not collectible, is it? Well, it's it's not collectible, and also at the moment, um, debt debt raising is a manual process that each individual invoice has to be input into the system by a human being. Now, the first thing I've done since arriving is I've had a discussion with our FMS provider, and we're getting a spreadsheet loader model built, which will allow either people to input it on bulk on a spreadsheet, which would be a lot faster for them because you know, they can take it out whatever system they're using and put it into that spreadsheet. Or hopefully we can get the, the systems to recreate the flat files that the spreadsheet creates to load into the ledger. So I'm hoping to that would be a big efficiency saving for a start. So instead of somebody spending six or seven days every quarter, say, putting trade waste invoices in, they won't be doing that because it'll come straight out of the trade waste system and straight into the ledger. And that's time that then can then be spent on chasing the debt and monitoring the debt rather than just keying it into the system. So that would be a big efficiency going forward. Okay, hey, thank you. I, I guess we just need to be kept informed, I guess, of, of, of how that's going. I think that's the, the, the kind of revenue side of things discussed. And then, and then obviously the other thing we're looking at is the, is the capital budget. Um, is there anything you wanted to add specifically about that at this stage? No, only, only again to reiterate there, I'm going to change the way it's presented to you because at the moment it's all in one lump in the first year and then you end up with the roll forwards, which can make the financing of the whole capital programme very confusing and there's no linkage between between it and the revenue accounts in the individual year. So we're going to change the way that that's done. So you've got realistic estimates in which in, in financial years of what the, the, the overall capital programme will be. Okay, thank you. I don't think there are any other points that people want to raise at this point. So the, the recommendations are on page 175. Um, are we just noting these, Will? Yeah, or, again, just for noting, Chairman. So yeah. we're not, we don't need to vote. So we're just noting the, the revenue budget overspend or forecast overspend and the, the carry forward element of the capital budget. So I think we just need to note those um, members and we can move on to item eight, which is the annual treasury management review, which begins on page 191. The annual treasury review is um, in accordance with the um, codes of practices here for your um, review before it goes to executive to recommend to council. The report contains um, the how we've done on investments and treasury management and also on debt. It's a fairly comprehensive report and I don't think it needs any more than that. Sorry, oh, you're quite right. It's very comprehensive it's a bit kind of technical I might argue probably how do you how do you find link as a provider of these services do you think they're okay um i've had both link and arling close um as treasury advisors my personal preference is for arling close i have to say arling close uh, no, i've come, come across them before arling close arling, arling um, when 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 link was sector was sector treasury sector treasury services some of their people left and formed a new um, sort of treasury consultancy called Arling Close. So there are basically in the in the local authority market, you either have Link or you have Arling Close. They are the two choices. Because obviously Link were part of what were, were sort of demerged from Capita, weren't they? Yeah, they were. But um, Arling, Arling Close came of a number of staff who left Capita and set up Arling Close. So. Okay, but for the but we're happy enough with Link as things go, I guess. Okay. Yes, yes. Um, are there any questions on this? I mean, this is rather, this is kind of backward looking, isn't it? I mean, for instance, it, it even predates when the tranche of borrowing matured, wasn't it, in May 2020, for instance? Yeah, it feels like a lifetime ago. It <laughs> it's a long time in uh, local authority. That is, that's There's no hands raised to the screen, Chair. I can't see anything unless you can. No, I can't. So, okay, then, so... The recommendation is on page 191, if we're happy to go there. So we, we, the recommendations that we're reviewing and commenting on the 1920 Treasury Management Activity Improvement Indicators. I think we've, we've reviewed it, but we don't have any comments. So do we need to vote on this one, Will? No, again, if we've covered it and if members haven't got any comments for now, that's that. Okay, fine. so if we're happy to move on, then we go on to item nine, which is on page 217. I think Councillor Ward will do his number then. I, I did quickly put my hand up, Chairman. Oh, beg your pardon. Sorry. Um, is that, is that on? Sorry, it wasn't, I wasn't using my blue hand. Is that um, on item eight or item nine? Item eight? Item eight, yes. Yeah, sure, sure. But it's probably relevant to item nine as well. Okay, okay. 
my agenda has just flicked right up to the top again from the table I was looking at. So I'll try and find where I were. Um, it was a question about the investment uh, portfolio composition. There was a line in there, unless I've mis misunderstood it, for lending to other local authorities. There was bank deposits, building society, and then local authorities. I think this is the table on page 203. Is that where it's got six and a half and 1.1%, 11% in it? Yeah, I just wondered, um, is, is that long-term, medium-term debt? And dare I ask which authorities, if we're, if we're allowed to know publicly, or maybe that's something Stephen could follow up to me by our email on. Um, these will be what's known as term deposits. So this would, will generally be less than a year. Sometimes they can just be overnight. Um, I don't have a problem with producing tables which list the particular um, building societies, local authorities and bank institutions, if that's what members would like at the end of every quarter so they can see them. Um, the thing about local authorities is, generally speaking, they don't go bust. The government tends to send commissioners before they go bust. Um, obviously, I might be a little bit reluctant to lend any money to Croydon at the moment, but... Um, <laughs> Generally speaking, uh, local authorities are as rock solid as governments, so um, unlikely to go um, bankrupt. Um, DMADF is the Debt Management Agency Deposit Facility, which is part of the, the Treasury Public Works Loans Board. And interestingly, now you have to pay them to take your you have to pay them to take your money. Um, but if, if members would like the actual local authorities, banks, etc., listed out under the, under each classification, I'm sure we can do that for you. It was uh, just with the, the news of, of the recent news in Croydon and there being several other local authorities who uh, have made similar choices to Croydon um, that may have problems lurking in, in the medium term. Uh, just a list of the local authorities would be of interest to me, if, if no one else. OK, well, if you were happy to do that, Steve, that would be great. I, I'm quite happy to put that in the report, the things in the reports, yes. Thank you. Okay, so we're on. If, if we're happy to move on to item nine, then, which is oh, chairman, this is the mid-year report. Yeah, <laughs> treasury and investment. Um, to date, um, there was a technical breach of um a counterparty limit uh, because when we received the money for the um the business support grants as part of COVID, um, we went over the twenty million pounds counterparty limit at NatWest for a couple of days. Uh, that was reported at the time by um, Bob Palmer. So this report is actually asking for a counterparty yeah. limit increase at um, NatWest to 30 million to uh, deal with the fact that those short term cash flows may be possible, are, are likely from government. And that it, it, it's often quite difficult to shift that amount of cash out of the bank account into investments, simply because nobody seems to be taking cash these days. Yeah. How long, how long would, were we... Are we, are we still in breach of it? Or, or, uh, we, I, think it was, I think we're in breach for two days, and I think Bob Palmer um, reported it as in accordance with the regulations as quickly as possible. So who do you um, have to report so it to? I'm, I'm not sure if it's saying, I think it's the next meeting of the executive. So it was it was reported to the executive, I think. From So it's, we don't have to report it to anybody external? No, no, no. It's, it's, just, it's just because we've so, set, because council set those counterparty limits. If we yeah. breach them, we're supposed to report them as soon as possible to the, to, to, to the appropriate committee or to the council and um, it happened because um, obviously there was more than 20 million I think it was 23 million came in in one day so it was just over that and it was just one of those things that occasionally they occasionally happen it wasn't it wasn't a deliberate breach it was inadvertent because the, the money the amount of money coming in from the government and it's just we just asked to raise the the the, the limit on on the council's own bank to 30 million because it covers us for this sort of stuff okay fine Okay, well, we note that then. Okay, so are there any questions on this report, which is obviously the mid, mid the mid-year report, as we know? No blue hands. I'd say I didn't have any questions on it apart from the, the Nat West item. No questions. Okay, if there are no questions, members, the recommendations are on page two one seven. So we're reviewing and commenting on treasury management activity for the first six months of 2021. So obviously this does reflect the fact that the, the, the large amount of the fixed um, or the, the structural borrowing has matured now. So that's good. So we've just got one small amount left now. Is it one and a half million or something? 
Uh, it's something like that at eight point eight five percent. Yes. Yeah, I think that's got quite a long life, to, or a longer life to. It, yeah, it? it's um, it's 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 the ridiculous way that the um the discounts work to repay that. You'd you'd end up paying far far more than you will just paying the the loan off as it goes to the end of its life. It's um, it's it's how it's how the Public Works Loans Board works. So it, there's just you just cannot do debt rescheduling. It yeah. doesn't make any economic sense. So. No, no, I think we've we've kind of we've talked about that a bit before, and obviously this these reports sort of deal in quite some detail about sort of borrowing costs because obviously we're we're, we're in our part of our capital project plan we will need to start borrowing won't we which we haven't done for, for a long time and so it's just about looking at i mean i think the the outlook for interest rates is it's fairly benign i would say i don't really i don't think anyone sees interest rates rising certainly for the next couple of years probably um, and so I guess it's a good, you know, if, if, there were, if there was a good time to borrow funds, this is probably it. I, I would say you're never going to see money this cheap again. But then okay. I'm not going to say that because I don't want to tempt fate. No. So if we were to borrow, at whatever point we do borrow, we'll be, we'll be borrowing at fixed rates. So we'll be fixing the rate at the time, at the time the loan is taken out, won't we? So we'll, be, we'll have certainty in terms of how much the loan is going to cost us. Typically, how long do you think the borrowing will be for? How, what will the length of the, the borrowing be, be, do you think? Do you have any idea? Well, it, it, depend, it depends on the particular project and, and what the payback of, on it is. So, um, oh, so they'll be, be, be tailored for the, for the particular project, I guess. Yeah. Yes. I mean, we we, we sure. I mean, we finance the capital program as a whole, but we, we take into account um, debt maturities as well, because we also have to take into account the authorised limit and the operational boundary on debt, because the council can't carry more debt than they can afford to service. So, you know, there there will be a limit to how much debt that can be outstanding at any one time. Do you think that will that in any way restrict us in what we're trying to do, or do you think we're we're going to be well within that limit in terms of what what we're looking to do with regard our capital projects? Um, it will depend. It will depend on. Um, it would very much depend on what 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 occurs at Old River Lane about if we're if we're if we're buying back those properties, but we're not then selling them on. Then that's going to have an interesting debt debt um, debt profile, which is going to need to be paid off. Um, but that will potentially restrict you if you if we if we kept them all in our ownership. So um, there's there's issues like that. And also, as well, we need to we need to take into account just how much how much borrowing the council could actually afford to bear, because we have to take into account uh, emergencies. I mean, for example, if the Department for Work and Pensions um, stop paying um, housing benefit grant to us for whatever reason, that would be an immediate 33, 34 million call that we, we, we would have to fund in cash if we had to carry on paying it. So you, you, you take into account very extreme emergencies for um, yeah. such things. Um, it's, it's okay. difficult without having the proper capital program set out in each of the years to understand, and as I said to you, because it's all in one block, I'm, I'm struggling to understand how it's being financed in future years if, if it's not in the years, if you see yeah, what I mean. Yeah, exactly. So do you think, when do you think that might be, the, the, the method of reporting will be changed? I think well, that, that, that will be in the capital program at your next meeting, which oh, is in good. January, which is um, your, your potential um, joint scrutiny with overview and scrutiny of the budget. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay then, so if members are happy to do so, we're at page 217. So are we happy to take, we have, essentially we have, we've, we've done the reviewing bit, but we haven't got any comments, essentially. I, I think that's probably true. So are we happy to take the three recommendations together? Do we need to, well, do we need to, forgive me, I keep asking this, do we need to vote on these? It's or okay, not? no, again, I was just going to say that, you know, they've been reviewed and you've been given, okay. given comments. So I, 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 I think that hopefully members are happy, then we, we, you know, we've given them a bit of a review, we've had a chat about them, but I think we've got no comments on them. So on that basis then, I think we need to move on to item 10, which is the budget and the medium term financial plan beginning on page 249. <laughs> Just before uh, you start, Stephen, sorry, it should maybe it's useful for me to mention about the appendices, Chairman. Yes, please. Um, Thank you. Uh, so to members who weren't in the meeting just before we started, um, I think while well, Stephen did send the appendices to me and they haven't been included um, inadvertently, so I do apologise about that. They've been circulated um, to members via email if they want to pull that up now. Um, but I will republish the agenda and just for the benefit, obviously, of any uh, of the public that are watching along. So, again, apologies. Um, they have been made available to members, but they're not there in the pack for reference, just so everybody's aware. So just to be clear, then, for members, sort of the appendices that Will was referring to, Appendix A was 
uh, contained detailed leadership team proposals and Appendix B was executive initial view on the proposals. I think members have got them now. The other point that I think that Steve just mentioned was that, um, and this is for members to consider, I think we were thinking that it would be a good idea to have um, at our next meeting, which is in January, to hold a joint meeting of the two scrutiny committees to discuss this item again. I don't know what members think about that. I think that might be quite a good idea for us to, to you know, things will be moving on between now and then, and for us to have a joint meeting of the two scrutiny committees to go over this item would be quite useful, I think. Would members be in favour of that? Yeah. Oh, was, yeah. Well, maybe we can have a discussion of the item now, and then once we've, we're done, we can think about it again. But I, I think I think we've done this in the past. We have had a, a sort of joint meeting of, of, of the scrutiny committees to think about the budget, and I think I think this year in particular, I think will be very useful. So, Stephen, I think we're we're ready um, for you to to give your overview on this item, if you're if that's okay. Yeah, sorry, Chairman, I had to go and get a glass of um, something to drink. Is that gin or something? Is that gin? Not the second person who's accused me of drinking gin at the yeah, meeting uh, tonight. No, it's a bit of a, no, it's not gin. Can't be a coincidence. No, no, it is not gin. <laughs> I can assure you it's not gin. Or well, um, a vodka man. No, 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 no. Um, <laughs> right, so... Um, members will recall that they had a all-members briefing session uh, earlier in the year and which it was in which they, you were informed that the sort of the budget gap has developed into a million in uh, 21 22 a million in 22 23 and a further two million in 23 24 uh, and those savings have to be ongoing in each year so by the time we reach 23 24 we have to have had four million pounds of, of reduction in the net cost of how the council operates um now, uh, to give you some sort of context, that four million represents a 26% reduction on the 2021 budget. A 26% reduction on the 2021 budget. Mm -hmm. So we were tasked by the executive to go away and um, produce some proposals, um, which have been produced by um, the leadership team. Those proposals in full are in Appendix A or Appendix 1. Um, they were sent to the executive and they were... Um, they sent their responses in uh, their early responses in Appendix B, those that they are minded to take forward, those that they have some questions over and those that they are not minded to take forward. And I see I use the uh, phrase minded advisedly because they will not make that decision until the executive meeting following this committee's meeting. So this committee can comment to the executive on where it's agreeing or not agreeing on those proposals being taken forward. In terms of the proposals that the leadership team have put together, there is a package of um, key strategic ones that will deliver the majority of the budget savings. That is charging for garden waste services, um, the introduction of further car parking charges and um, ch par charging for parking 24 hours a day in council car parks. Um, the capital pr projects on the leisure centres and the Hartford Theatre are projected to save about 800,000 in 2023, 20, 24, when those, when those are completed. They, they, they're between the, the, that's 800 for that and 700 from um, the garden waste and about half a million from parking, which is a substantial amount of the budget savings that are being made. In, in parallel with this, um, the leadership team are, have proposed um, that the council undergoes a transformation program where we look at how we work, to make, um, it's, it's called agile working. It means we don't need as much office space. It means um, officers are um, able to work from home and the office part of the time. It means that we are equipping them with technology, which means that we are as efficient as, and effective as possible. And it also means about having a more commercial mindset. That transformation program will take some time to do, but it, it, it will yield savings um, from experience elsewhere. It, it means that the customers will be doing more self-service digitally. At the moment, I, I sent some of our customers are frustrated that they can't use the website to do um, transactional stuff. Um, and that, that sort of stuff is possible to be done, but it requires the investment in the IT, etc. So there's there's that second part of, of transforming the council. And that may mean that we move out of Hartford and out of Warfields. It may not. We may reprovide a smaller building or we may only use part of the building. But there is that transformation program as well as the, the savings that um, have been proposed by the leadership team. Some of those savings are... 
subject to review. I mean, for example, there was the um, come out of the Hertfordshire Resilience Partnership, which um, I don't think we will be recommending you take forward in the current circumstances. I think that would be a bit of a shooting your own foot off moment. So not all of them are going to going to happen, even if if we've put them up and um, the executive has said they're minded to take them. So there's still a discussion over some of them. So there is a package there. Um, the budget will be the budget gap will be closed in the first year. Uh, the second and the third year, there's still work to do. Um, but um, the, the key ones are the garden waste, the parking, uh, the, the extra yields, which will come from not paying subsidies when the capital programs come through and savings, which we will identify as we start to transform the council into a more modern customer focused, IT driven, agile working sort of council. Thank you very much for that introduction. Thank you. Uh, well, um, Castle time for questions. Council Wall Booth, I think you have a question. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, a couple of comments on the uh, proposed savings, and this this might feed more into Stephen's point about a more medium to longer term transformation. But in the short term, I, I think some departments are to be commended for the, uh, in some cases, quite radical savings they've proposed in their own backyards, and other departments are not and have put forward very few sort of uh, pro concrete proposals for savings. And one department that I'd like to, to focus on is human resources. Um, it costs, in terms of a proportion of our revenue budget, it costs an extraordinary amount of money for an organization this size. And it astonishes me that, for example, we are still doing payroll broadly in house, unlike any other similar sized organization. Um, so I think there, there are, I'd, I'd like some reassurance that there's going to be a, a sort of detailed microscope under all departments, irrespective of the proposals they've submitted, because I think some departments have, and I might look towards Ben's direction at this point, some departments have um, courageously rushed forward to offer savings and um, others haven't. Uh, in terms of the two savings that have been suggested by HR, with regard to apprentices, I think it would be beneficial if apprentices are included in uh, whichever department where they're going to go as budget line. So if planning, say they want a planning apprentice, it has to be justified in their budget and then it's part of planning rather than having th this central apprentice chunk. I think that might make more sense. Um, and I, th I think there might be greater scope for training, uh, savings on the training budgets, particularly given uh, how we've all adapted to using uh, Zoom and e-learning going forward. Um, thank you. Do you want me to respond, Chairman? Yes, please. Yeah, um, you thank you very much. Uh, Sorry, thank you. Well, having managed payroll and having outsourced payroll and having had to bring it back again in house within a year because the payroll provider was an absolute disaster zone because they can't cope with local government i'm probably going to we'll, we'll probably have to agree to disagree about um it being outsourced is the best way because local government local government and outsourced payroll providers are not a good mix i have to say in my experience it's if, if it's gone badly wrong anywhere it's gone badly wrong because it's been outsourced i have to say and that's that's just um, my experience of it. Um, I agree on the. I agree there should be savings from electronic tra training, but um, I'll give you an example of. Um, there are many training providers who are still charging the two hundred and fifty pounds per delegate rate, because that was the rate they were charging when they're in central London at a hotel with a lunch. But they're still charging that rate. Their prices haven't come down yet. So, and that's and that and they've replaced that physical training with um, online training. So it's the same course, it's just delivered over Zoom or something like that. So until we start seeing those prices coming down from training providers, then we're not going to see, we're not going to see those efficiencies. But I agree with you, they should be there. Um, yes, every service area is, be, is subject to challenge. I myself have only six months because I'm new in post. I have six months and then I've got to start producing savings myself. So I, I think, I mean, every service area was critically friended during the process. I mean, it was a, was a very frantic month, I have to say, a baptism of fire coming in the whole process. So, and um, we will, of course, be doing some benchmarking um, 
which will be coming through uh, to your next meeting as well, which is 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 East Hertfordshire District Council an expensive council compared to its um, statistical nearest neighbours? And by that, I mean councils with similar levels of um, sparsity um, and demographics, etc. And then also compared to all other district councils in England. So that information will be coming through as well. And I'm also done. I'm also doing a five year analytical review of budgets against actuals to see if anybody's padding any budgets. So I think I've, I think I think. I think I probably squared off every every um, base. If, if anybody was hiding anything in padding in the budgets, I think I'm going to catch them, and also we'll better understand where the council is expensive and where it isn't. And um, there are always interesting exercises there, because everybody has a perception of a certain service area being expensive, and um, it's never that service area that's actually the most expensive. So, thank you. If I, if I could just come back, yeah, certainly, of course. Um, I, irrespective of outsourcing is the wrong way, we can we can share functions like that with other authorities and I think um, I think the savings proposals that have been proposed focus on increasing income and increasing charges um, I think there is greater scope for internal cuts that don't face uh, our residents and the services we provide residents and also I think building control is a prime example of where we can share and you know irrespective of whether unitaries are coming down the road towards us at some point in the medium term there's no reason why we can't do more on that sort of uh, building control shared service point and be a little bit more ambitious i think you, you, uh, that's you may, part you of what do. agile working will deliver that's part of what the agile working yeah. program is about um certainly when i've done it in the past we we shared environmental health with a neighbouring council. We shared legal services with a neighbouring council. So that's part of the agile working stuff as well. But it, it, it's always going to be a balance between income generation, charging, uh, seeking to reduce net, net cost. But the, 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 that's why I said to you that, that that part of it over the three years is a, is a crucial part of, 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 of bridging the, um, the savings gap that we, that we have. I mean, I, at my previous council, we... We took, I think, four million out, and uh, we didn't reduce. We didn't substantially reduce the service offers offer to the customer, and that that was the intent, intention. Again, here is to not to substantially reduce the service offer to the customer, and that's part of what that agile working is about. So, um, I, I'm I'm saying it, but don't 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 think I'm just I'm saying these words to fob you off. It is a crucial part of delivering the budget that that agile working, and it will be it will be crucial to delivering. The budget savings and it will also be a leaner fitter faster footed council at the end of it thank you and this is indeed is one of the recommendations that we're looking at isn't it on, on in terms of the, the, the program which will transfer the council in place of its financially sustainable footing okay any other questions but i think in your introduction i mean the thing i think that we need we need to bear in mind at, at all times is that we, you know the, the amount of savings we've got to find are eye-wateringly high and then this inevitably means that we've got to make some difficult, with the council, I should say, I've got to make some difficult decisions. And, and some of the, the large areas of savings, you know, in, in charging for green waste and car parking charges are amongst the difficult decisions that the council are going to have to make because they, they supply the large areas of savings that we need to find to, to, to balance the budget. And, 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 and I think we need to, to be prepared to make these difficult decisions to enable us to, um, to balance the budget when we come to, to look at it again. Are there any other questions anybody wants to ask? Now if we if we bear in mind that the, the recommendations that we've got to look at are on page 250, so we'll be coming to those in a minute. I, I'm not seeing any questions from anybody at this stage. Um, and also bear in mind that we're, we're suggesting that we have a uh, at our next meeting in January, uh, a joint scrutiny session to look at this item again. And I think, which I think would be a very good idea. Um, we need to be, you know, if we haven't got any more questions, I think we've all, we've all had a, um, a good opportunity to um, sort of be, to have these, uh, the, the rationale for the various savings to be explained to us. And so I think these aren't, aren't coming to us um, for the first time. Um, but if we haven't got any other questions to ask, we need to move to the recommendations if members are happy on page 250. And for a first, for the well, the other thing I'd just like to say is I'd, I'd like to thank Steve and his team for which must have been a huge amount of work to get us to where we are 
And uh, I think we really ought to, th to thank you and your, your colleagues for the work that you've done on this. Especially colleagues on leadership team. I, I think I think Ben was up as late as I was several nights. Um, um, well, indeed, all, I think I think I suspect all the officers have been involved on this, and I, I think we, you know, as members, we should be really grateful to, for all the work you put into this. Okay. Well, uh, first, the first recommendation is to comment on the savings proposals to the executive, subject to any. I mean, I guess there were, there would be some some more impact assessments to be done. And, this, and, and there may be some um, amendments. Uh, and this is gonna be a bit of a movable feast, isn't it? I think as we move into, into the new year. Um, but as far as what I'm seeing is that, that we are broadly content with the, the proposals that, we, that, we, that, we, that we've seen and we haven't got any comments to make. Do we need to, Will, do we need to vote on this? You will need to vote on uh, these these recommendations, Chairman. So you okay. Can just I'll be happy to, if I read through them. I'll be happy to take them all on block. I, maybe we we are. So I, recommendation B is to is to, to note and endorse the guidance to officers that the budget proposal should be based on a council rate increase of five pounds, which is the most that we can we can put through without a, without a referendum. Uh, and general inflation assumption of up to 1% and the provision for national pay award will be up to 2%. Do you think they're realistic numbers, Stephen, in terms of the pay award? Uh, inflation next year is um, anticipated to be around the what to build 1.8%. Therefore, I think 2% is a safe option. Um, wow. It would be the September. Most things are indexed according to inflation in September this year, which so therefore 1% is it's about right. There. Okay, fine. Um, and then the, uh, recommendation C is to endorse the production of the phased capital programme over five years to better reflect the actual phase of delivery. Is that what you were talking about before? Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm talking about before. So instead of having 70 million all in one year and then yeah. carrying forward 30 and 20, and it, it, you can see 70 million, but it's spread and it's, it's estimated incorrectly into those financial years. And then you should be able to, to match the capital financing back to the revenue account in each of the years. Because at the yes. moment, you have a big block of capital programme here. And then you've got five and then you've got three years worth of revenue account with with financing in it but the capital program's all in, in a lump over here so yes okay makes, well, that makes, makes absolute sense transparent. that makes absolute sense and the last item uh, recommendation d is the one we've talked about making the council more agile uh, and then it's endorsing the additional program of work to transform the council to place it on a financially sustainable footing and set out in paragraph 4.7 okay well they're the recommendations uh, i'm not seeing any blue hands so uh, do we have a proposal for those recommendations Councillor Fernando, you're proposing. Councillor Aldo, you're seconding. Thank you. So that we've got a proposal in a second. All those in favour? I think that is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. So that brings us on to item 11, which is standards update. James, I think this is your item. Beginning on page 263. Yes, yes indeed, Councillor Pope. Um, so this is a uh, just a general update for members on standards issues generally. The report can probably be split into two parts. Uh, the first part is uh, just updating members on uh, what has been happening with the um, um, proposed model code of conduct. Um, you will have seen at 2.4 of the report where I, where I refer to a, const, uh, a, consultation, um, a consultation exercise that was carried out. Uh, between June and August. Members were encouraged to take part in that consultation. A few members did get in touch with me to say that they had done so. Um, you will see further on in, in that section that uh, due to uh, uh, presumably the, the current uh, global pandemic that things have been slowed down somewhat. Um, there has not been a response um, to queries as to you know at which stage that model code is. Um, East Hearts' code of conduct, in my opinion, as the monitoring officer, probably does need a little bit of a review and a bit of an update. Um, it's not clear when it was actually last updated, um, but it probably could do with a bit of sprucing up. However, members might take the view that with the model code of conduct possibly coming into coming into place at some stage, then it might be uh, unwise to embark on that kind of job now when whatever we come up with might just be changed subsequently by the model code anyway. Um, so that's the first part of the report. And then the second is just a bit of an update as to um, the types of complaints that have been coming in to me as the monitoring officer. Um, I think it's important that members of the Audit and Governance Committee are 
are given updates such as these because otherwise you won't know whether there are any complaints and uh, it may lead to a sort of a, a false sense of security that there aren't any complaints and aren't any problems happening anywhere when when that isn't the case and um, so you'll see the types of complaints that have come in um, I've specified whether they're at district level or whether they're parish and parish or town councils and uh, how they've been resolved and whether they're ongoing or not. Um, you will see there's an inconsistent numbering in that it goes one, two, three, five, seven. The reason for that is outlined at paragraph 2.10, which is the fact that when someone makes a complaint and then subsequently withdraws it, um, we I keep the numbering, but I, I, I don't have anything to report upon because there, there isn't a, a, compl a complaint anymore. Um, th that's the report. I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. It is just for noting, uh, so happy to take any questions anyone might have on it. Thank you, you James. At the moment, Chairman. You mentioned about the um, the model code of conduct, and forgive me, I couldn't see when do we think that may come in because it, it strikes me that it makes sense to wait for that rather than to do some work now and then have it sort of wiped away by the when the new model code comes in. How long do you think we'd have to we've got to wait? I'm sorry, forgive me if I'm missing it. Uh, well, at the moment, it's uh, how long is a piece of string? Uh, you'll see at uh, paragraph two point seven. Uh -huh. uh, on the 6th of July, the CSPL uh, chair, Lord Evans, wrote to um, Robert Jenrick MP, who is the Secretary of State for Housing Community of Government, of course, uh, asking him for an update as to when uh, the government would be, be providing a response to the outcome of the consultation, period, uh, uh, the consultation exercise. Um, no response has been no received response, yeah. um, from Mr Jenrick just yet. Um, so what you would imagine is that once... Um, uh, the Right Honourable Mr Jenrick does uh, get back to the chair and sort of provides a bit of feedback on the consultation, then it can move forward a, a bit a bit more and we'll know where we are after that. Sure. Well, well I don't know what members think, but I, I'd be inclined to, to, to wait to see how that develops rather than to embark on a, a body of work on this matter, only to have it sort of amended or, or, or maybe even wiped away. What do you think to that? You mentioned that in your your, your kind of presentation there. Do you think that's do you think that's a reasonable course of action? Uh, yeah, if if the if the this um, piece of work hadn't been sort of kicked off, the, the model code of conduct work hadn't been kicked off in the first place, then I, I would say let's just go about it ourselves and sort of and as I say, review an update, you know, on our own. But as you say, it it, it may prove to be a waste of time if we go through that whole process. It would involve me writing a, a, a new code of conduct, bringing it back to yourself for comment, um, and then needing it to get adopted. And then, as you say, at the end of that entire process, you know, things might move along quicker. We don't know how, how fast things are going to change once the vaccines are in place and other business can be looked upon. Um, so it, it is very, uh, it is very, as I said, uh, how long is a piece of string as to how long that might be, but it could end up in a lot of wasted, wasted time if we did back on uh, a, a complete sprucing up on our own okay so member would members be happy that we would that we should wait for the model code of conduct or some progress to be made on developing a Councillor Huggins uh yeah I just think we uh ought to set a time limit uh for that to have progressed before it comes back to this committee to make a re-evaluation but okay. happy to defer what sort of time limit do you think uh, Councillor Stone would it be practical to say we review it again in six months so we're keeping in touch with it? Yeah, that's not a bad idea. James, do you think that's a good idea, six months? Uh, well, members, I, I'm, I'm not sure what you're used to in the past with regards to reports of this type. I'm, I don't think you've had a sort of a general standards update before. <laughs> have you? I don't, I don't think I don't think. I don't think. I think you're right. I don't think we have. I think we, yeah, I think you know, there hasn't really been. My, my intention going forward is to try and have this as a bit more of a sort of a standing yeah. uh, that comes back to you a bit more regularly. Um, and therefore, what I would probably suggest is the best way forward is that the next time I bring a report like this to you, then we can we can have another look at where, where okay. we are, and where okay. the government are within, and then we can make a decision at that stage. OK, are we happy with that? So in terms of the recommendation, which is which is on page 263, is that we'll we'll continue to monitor it and it'll come through with your regular reports to this committee. Okay. Do we, is that a vote? Is that a vote or we just we just need to agree that, William?
It's just... Yeah, well, the, the, yeah, the report's just for noting, Chairman. But okay, so obviously... we'll just, we'll take, we're noting the report and we'll continue to monitor the situation with regard to the, how the uh, development of a, 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 a model code is, is going. Great, thank you. So that brings us on to item 12, which begins on two six, page 269. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, this is in relation to uh, members having more involvement in the development and review of the constitution. Um, I believe previously uh, at East Hearts has been um, more a case of members, of officers uh, looking at the constitution, making what change, or recommending what changes need doing and then, then progressing with that. Um, however, there has been some comments made by members that they don't feel that they've had any sort of buy-in into that process and have commented that they would like to have that buy-in into the process and be able to help shape and comment on what uh, changes, if any, are required in the constitution from time to time. Um, therefore, the, the suggestion is that a, uh, an informal constitution review group be established uh, consisting of six members, three from the controlling Conservative group, one from the Liberal Democrats group, one from the Green and, and one from Labour. Um, it would be, uh, it would be, uh, as I said, an informal group, so it doesn't need to be politically balanced uh, and doesn't need to have any sort of formal reporting um, aspects to it. Uh, and uh, the, the terms of reference should be uh, that the group looks to identify significant or strategic changes um, to the uh, constitution. So uh, it, it's not a case of going page by page, um, making grammatical or, or spelling uh, suggestions. It, it is the more, much more sort of, uh, you know, wider looking at it and making, as I say, significant uh, suggestions. Uh, now, there may be circumstances where things are not able to be changed, uh, whether that's because of uh, legislation or, or something else. Um, and in those scenarios, then clearly members can make suggestions, um, but myself as the monitoring officer would, would, would uh, be able to advise members as to whether or not that change is actionable or not. Uh, and then um, from there on in, um, clearly when the, when the constitution review does then go forward uh, to, to council to look at later on in the year, hopefully members will then feel that they have had that um, input into it and uh, everyone will be much happier with, with what's produced. Okay, thank you. So I think I think the it's fairly clear that uh, I think so. We, we need to know, need to sort of let the various group leaders know if 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 we, if, if we as individuals are interested in being a member of this group, and then the the, the, the group that the group leaders will decide who to put forward to you, James. Yes, sorry, uh, Chair. I should have uh, should have um, explained that a bit more as, as, as we've discussed previously but um what i think would work the best uh, from my perspective is that clearly um where members are needing to be sort of um suggested for this group uh, if the group leaders could um have those discussions with their um group colleagues and then suggest which members they would like to put forward and email them through to myself uh, and then once i've got the uh six members in place then we can obviously say that that group is constituted of those members and we, we can we can take it from there okay thank you okay guys i think that's fairly straightforward i don't think there are any questions so we just need to contact the leaders of the various parties to sig signify our interest in, in in participating so the Recommendations are on page 269. So I think we've, we've dealt with recommendation A. And the, I guess the terms of reference for the for the group will be determined. Uh, the, the terms of reference are, are, are more or less there. So um, it is to identify significant or strategic changes and make recommendations to the Autumn Government Committee at its final oh, meeting. Okay, okay. Okay, so are we happy with those two recommendations on this item, members? Yep, fine, thank you. That brings us on to 13, which is GDPR and information governance. Can I just check on that, James? Were you envisaging that there would be a vote taken on that just to establish a group, or are you, are you happy with that? Uh, yeah, I, I think I think we'd probably just take a vote just to make fine. sure. Fine, okay, apologies, yeah. okay. So we need a proposal, Councillor Huggins to propose, Councillor Ward Booth to second. All those in favour? Brilliant, that's unanimous, thank you. Now we're on to item 13. Thank you very much. Sorry about that. So 13, page 273. 
Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so this is a, a, in response to a, a comment that was made or, rec or a suggestion that was made at the meeting of the Audit and Governance Committee on the 28th of July, uh, where uh, that, that an update be provided on information governance and GDPR compliance. Um, now, there was uh, a suggest, uh, as I said, a, a request made at the meeting and also a subsequent email was sent by a member of the committee um, asking some further questions, which you can see at 2.2 of the report. Um, what you will see also from, uh, oh, sorry, let's have a look. Yes, so... It, what the council or what we're planning on doing with its information governance uh, uh, arrangements was to uh, we explored the, the prospect of going into a shared service with um, Stevenage Borough Council. Um, however, upon looking at the details of that, um, of, of the logistics of that and the costs associated with it, um, a decision was taken that um, we would actually pursue uh, our own officer uh, working for East House rather than be a shared appointment with another council. Um, so what has happened since uh, July when the, uh, this was last discussed is that we have created that post, we've um, put together the job description and personal specifications and we've gone to advertise. Uh, we've had an application and uh, it is progressing to sort of interview stage very shortly. We've had one interview, we'll be going to a second interview shortly. Um, hopefully once that uh, is recruited to, if we're able to, then that person will be tasked with um, performing an audit on where the council sits with regards to GDPR compliance. Uh, from my uh, looking at how the council has been operating since I came in in February, uh, it, it looks as though to me that when the GDPR uh, were introduced in 2018, uh, an external um, person was brought in to produce all of the documentation that we required. Uh, they were produced, uh, everything was uh, fine and hunky dory and then uh, for whatever reason uh, that's not been maintained since 2018. So uh, again th there is a two-year gap there where we need to sort of catch up with where we should be. This officer when we are hopefully able to appoint uh, will be tasked with making sure that we are back to where we need to be. Um, there were some additional questions asked as I said at 2.2. The answers to, the, to those are provided at 2.8. Uh, you will see what the answers are there. I will just say the first one, where it makes reference to 36 data breaches, um, does sound like quite a lot. I thought it was a lot when I first heard them, but when you delve into the figures, it isn't actually that much at all. When you consider the amount of processes that the council does on a daily basis, when you think of um, council tax, uh, letters that are sent out, planning applications, licensing, uh, we're talking uh, about a, a very high number of transactions that take place. Uh, in the thousands, if not tens of thousands. Uh, to have 36 data breaches since May 2018 is quite low, very low. Uh, and only two of those deemed serious enough to be reported to the ICO and subsequently no sanctions were um, imposed on those two either. 100% uh, of those 36 data breaches were down to human error. Uh, now human error is something that we can do uh, we, we can do something to reduce the amount of human error but you will never be able to eradicate it completely there, there will be instances of human error no matter how much work you put into it um so in in total we've we've done quite well there uh, you'll also see the uh subject data subject access requests as well in in which we've had a 92 percent success rate in getting uh, those responses out uh, within the time limit um and happy to take any questions members might have on that. Are there any questions? Council Hallport, this was an item I think that you looked at quite closely. Are you happy with the response that we've got? Are there any things you wanted to raise? Yes, I'd just say thank you for the comprehensive report which has answered all the questions that were asked. Well, that's great, thank you. Well, James, thanks very much indeed for that. It's, uh, so, obviously, you mentioned you're, you're quite close to a higher in this area. I think that'll be a, that that should be a real sort of catalyst to, for this thing, th this area to come back on track again. Yes, I, I think, um, as I said, from from my, for, from my perspective, looking almost at it from the outside, the things as I'm sort of looking at the council before I joined, it, it looks as as I said, we got someone in in 2018 to do the work. 
And uh, it was a shame that that was an external person who was coming in for a very specific task for a very um, specific amount of time. So clearly when they walked out the door, having done the work, I think what we probably needed to do at that point was give the reins over to someone to, to continue that work. And it, it doesn't appear to me that that probably happened. So hopefully if we are able to uh, hire to the post that we are currently um, going through the process for, that will be their task. That'll be one of their tasks to make sure that we are continuing to, to maintain high standards and that we are not left in a situation where things are, are allowed to slip again. Is this an area maybe where this committee might get a report? On a, not every meeting maybe, but a sort of a regular, reasonably regular intervals once this new person joins perhaps? I don't know what my members think or what, what, what new officers think. Um, if, if you were able to um, be more specific as to what you would like the report to be on, uh, you, you could probably do that. I think probably what the best way of doing it is through the annual governance statement, because uh, I think that was one of the things that flagged this in the first place in the fact that um, uh, there was a SIAS um, audit on our information and governance um, procedures, uh, which came back with some suggestions that we needed to do stuff, which is why of course we are doing those things so it might be a case that you wait for the annual governance statement or the next size um audit which will flag any shortcomings if there are any at that point anyway but not just shortcomings is it, well i guess you know if we were to get something even things like if there have been any data breaches you know have, have any of these things been reported to the ico maybe you know if there have been any sort of data subject access requests perhaps but just a bit a, a bit like what you the sort of information you've included in your report here might be useful for us to see I, I, I'm not saying every meeting, but I don't know, once, twice a year, maybe. I don't know. Just if, so we can... If members can give a clear on uh, the frequency of uh, such a report, mm -hmm. then I'm happy, to, I'm happy to make sure that that comes forward. OK. Uh, Councillor Woolbooth, what do you think? Do you think it would be useful to have something every now and again? Why not? Um, given the sort of the statistics that we've, that we've got, what about every six months? Yeah, I, I think I would agree. Would members, do you think that's with that a six month kind of update would be a good idea? I'm seeing some nods around around the room, as it were. So, so the proposal is maybe to have a an update along along similar lines to the, maybe the report you've given us today, every six months. You know, when the the new person has, has come on board and has got had an opportunity to acclimatise, as it were, I think that would be quite useful if that's okay. Uh, yeah, so uh, what's it now, November? So we're talking May? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, if that's okay, everybody, I think. So, we, so the recommendation, whoever that is, goodness me, it is on page 273. So we're noting the content of the report and the observation, I guess, that we've, 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 we've given is that we, we'd like this sort of update every six months beginning in May 2021. So members, are we happy with that? Do we need to, uh, well, I'll just vote on it. So Council Court was proposing, Council Alder was nodding. That's so then we're in, I think, I think that's unanimous, thank you. Brilliant. So I think item 14, which is the last one, is the work programme beginning on page 279. Lorraine, is, is this your item? Yeah, yes, it is, Chairman. Thank you, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, um, you're, you've had a long wait, but here you are. Yeah. Um, this this is your uh, usual draft um, consolidated work program, which sets out the reports to be considered by both OS and ANG committees. Um, reports for consideration at your meeting in January 2021 have not yet been included, but this will be populated shortly. Um, the only thing, the only additional thing I wanted to make members aware was that. Um, following a review of scrutiny here by in March by the former Centre for Public Scrutiny, a workshop has also been arranged by the, the newly named Centre for Governance Scrutiny, as it's called, um, to which all members of OS and ANG will be invited. Um, it's an opportunity to consider their final report and seek clarification from the lead officer who carried out the investigation. Um, and then the report will be considered by ONS who may, um, may or may not take recommendations to the executive. 
Um, the workshop is going to be held on 3rd of December and Zoom credentials will be forwarded to you either by myself or um, Ian Parry at the um, Centre for Government Scrutiny. And the results of this exercise will, exercise will be fed into the annual scrutiny report. That's all I wanted to say, Chairman. Is that the, um, is that the invite you sent around a while ago? But Chairman, I've the... sent out so many. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Didn't you ask for um, availability? It was up for the 3rd of December. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I've, I've, been, I've been putting so many invitations out to training here, training at HCC, training with SIPFA, <laughs> training you, with um, the Centre for Government. Didn't you ask um, John Wiley and me if we could do it? Uh, yeah, yes, 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 yes. That was for the 3rd of December. Yeah, that was Great. the 3rd thought, of December. I'd, I'd, have, I'd have thought I might have missed something. Brilliant. OK. Yeah. Chairman, you've got a yeah. hand raised from Councillor Ward Booth on the Oh, well, sorry, sorry. Carry on. Councillor Ward Booth, beg your pardon. Thank you. Um, very quickly, the, the report, is that now finalised and could that be emailed around well in advance of the uh, training session? Um, I'll defer to James on that, if I may, Councillor Ward Booth. Yes, there, there, there is a report. And um, James, do you want to jump in and, and give a comment on that? Yes, uh, the last email I've, re I've received is that um, the final reports will be sent to us. Um, so it is in, final, in a final um, format, but we've not received it yet. Uh, I can certainly chase the centre for, um, I forget what their new name is. Governance and scrutiny. scrutiny. I, can, I can certainly chase them tomorrow and ask them to make sure that that's sent through in good time. But as I say, we don't have the final report yet. Thank you. Okay, as far as the work programme, we, can we just make sure that, you know, this joint meeting of scrutiny to look at the budget again is reflected for the January meeting? Yeah. And also going, looking further ahead, and maybe I should have mentioned this earlier, when we had the Section 106 report, which I thought was very good, I think we agreed we'd have those kind of annually. So can that be added to the... Oh, Jackie, big upon, you're still here. I'm so sorry. Yeah, um, yeah. Can we make sure we have that this time next year? Yeah. Yes, of course, Chairman. Something, something to look forward to. <laughs> I'll be able to bring you the next annual infrastructure funding statement oh, I can't to that wait. committee as well. I cannot, I cannot. Well, I'm assuming we're also we'll all be here, I suppose. OK. I, I, again, so if any members have got any suggestions about adding things on to the agenda, um, then please either kind of go direct, directly to Lorraine or, or whatever to, um, to see whether we can fit those in. And I, I think that's probably it then, isn't it? I don't think we've got anything else to add. If members are happy, the, rec oh, goodness me. the recommendation is on page... 279. Does it? 279. The three, we've got three, um, well, two recommendations, the main agenda rights to the next meeting be agreed and the proposed consolidated work program, appendix A in relation to the audit and matters being agreed. I mean, we're agreeing that I'll go, there's not very much on there for audit and governance yet, is there, I guess, yeah. but but we'll, that, it'll become apparent in due course, but we're definitely going to have the joint meeting of scrutiny to look at the budget and we're going to make sure that we continue to look at section 106. So I'll, I'm assuming we need to vote on these things, so we need a proposal, I dare say. That's Councillor right, yeah. Alder, she's nodding. Councillor Wall Booth is a seconder. I think that all those in favour of the recommendations, I think that's that's unanimous. I think we're done. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you so much, everyone.